Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, as, as you know, this event is being put on as part of Net Impact Week, which this year is focused on the people and businesses promoting social impact through their work in Los Angeles. Um, if you have any questions of, about anything that comes up during the, the uh, panel, please post them in the Q&A and we'll get back to them um, after the panel has ended. And uh, thank you to all of you who have attended this week's events and we look forward to seeing you at uh, the other ones throughout the week. Um, I want to also introduce today's moderator. Uh, Tim Kawahara is the ex founding executive director of the UCLA Zyman Center for Real Estate. Tim is deeply involved in, in uh, LA real estate, ser serving on numerous boards, leading program initiatives, and speaking frequently at conferences and to the media on real estate topics. He is extremely knowledgeable about affordable housing challenges and opportunities, and has sought over the past few years to incorporate more affordable housing programming into the Zyman Center's work. Thank you again, Tim, for agreeing to moderate this panel, and I'll pass it off to you. Great. Thanks, Eli. Yeah, this is a subject that is near and dear to us at UCLA. Um, fortunately, we've uh, compiled, or at least Eli, you've compiled a, a, an awesome panel. Um, everybody on the panel is so qualified and so interesting and so articulate. So let me just briefly introduce them. We have a pretty deep program, so I want to get through things as quickly as possible. But um, first, we have uh, Tara Baraskas, who's the executive director of the Community Corporation of Santa Monica, a very well-known nonprofit developer uh, in Santa Monica. And she also serves as a member of the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee at uh, the Zion Center. Next, we have Greg, Greg Commodore, who is um, uh, I'm a, pr a proud alum of Anderson. Um, in fact, he did a BCO here and founded his current business. So he's currently the co-founder of Daylight Community Development. Um, next, we have Brian DeAndrea, who is also an Anderson alum, uh, currently the senior VP, Century Housing Corporation, one of the largest in um, the Western United States and um, super knowledgeable, very experienced um, professional. And then finally, um, Javier Guzman, who's a VP, senior relationship manager um, at City National Bank. Uh, and he also is a Bruin, so um, graduated from the urban planning department, I think with a master's of urban planning. So. Um, very UCLA friendly uh, panel today. So, yeah. So, um, you know, despite the, the the title, overcoming barriers to affordable housing, we all got together and said, you know, we don't want to be completely Debbie Downers, and we know that's very difficult. So, you know, we'll also focus on some of the opportunities. So, uh, really, presentation more on sort of challenges and opportunities in the affordable housing space, and we'll try to give you a good overview of both both the challenges and the opportunities. Uh, to achieve affordable housing and to really focus on kind of the main issues, which are finance, regulation, politics, policy, zoning, entitlements, approvals, um, and the like. Um, so uh, why don't I just briefly get into a couple of um, uh, framing points. I mean, a lot of people ask, well, what is affordable housing exactly? And it's actually a very wide spectrum. Um, you know, a lot of us speak in terms of what we call area mean income. So that's the average income for a certain area. Um, and then HUD actually has some guidelines. They, they say that they categorize extremely low income as folks that are in the 15 to 30% of area mean income, very low income being 30 to 50% of AMI, uh, lower income at 50 to 80, or then moderate income um, at 80 to 120 AMI. Um, and of course, that is a very, um, you know, the, what we call the middle income. That's a very acute problem here in Los Angeles as well. There's um, housing that's being built that's subsidized, uh, but unfortunately, your middle income sort of firefighter, cops, teachers, nurses make too much money to qualify for subsidized housing, but not nearly enough to compete in the in the uh, market rate uh, category. So, uh, a very acute problem here in Los Angeles and in California. And of course, there are all sorts of subgroups that fall into this too. We're talking everybody thing, as I mentioned, everything from homelessness all the way up to middle income. And then within that, you'll see, you know, seniors and vets and foster children and uh, chronic, chronically homeless individuals, the disabled, folks that have uh, experienced sexual abuse and uh, so many different subcategories within the homeless population. Uh, this is actually a really important time in Los Angeles in terms of housing because we're uh, at the beginning stages of doing what's called a regional housing um, needs assessment, which is required on, on every eight years. It's a cycle that's set by law by the state of California. And so jurisdictions throughout Los Angeles are currently trying to come up with their housing targets uh, in terms of need for the community. Um, and then I must say that this year, with the exception of uh, unlike prior years, the state is actually coming down pretty hard with a hammer and really holding jurisdictions to the fire with regard to 
their needs assessments, um, goals and objectives, and, and even to the point where they're requiring siting and, and even zone changing that might uh, be needed to accommodate uh, the needs. So right in the middle of that process now, um, a group called SCAG oversees that, Southern California Association of Governments. And so we'll be watching that very carefully to see what the target numbers for each of the various jurisdictions within the SCAG region, Los Angeles being, being one of those. Um, so on your screen, just a few brief uh, kind of highlights that give you an, a sense of the, the how acute the problem here is in Los Angeles. I know Eli asked us to be very LA focused. So I looked up some LA focused numbers. Um, housing, as you might anticipate, is the largest expenditure component uh, for Los Angeles area households. 64% um, roughly, and you'll see different numbers, but all roughly the same from different organizations. But you know, about 60% of Los Angeles are renters. 73% uh, of households uh, are rent burdened, which means they spend over 30% of household income on rent, which again is part of a, a, a HUD um, uh, guidelines. 48% um, are what we call severely burdened, meaning they spend over 50% of household on rent. So you can imagine almost 50% of Los Angelinos are spending 50% of their household income on rent, which then they have to make very difficult decisions about paying uh, healthcare and education, food, and all sorts of other things. So it uh, gets very tight. Um, for example, the income needed for the average rent uh, apartment in LA County is $41.96 an hour, um, and the current minimum wage is $15 an hour. So you can see that your sort of minimum wage food service workers are having an incredibly difficult time. Um, and Los Angeles renters are the second most rent burden uh, in the nation. Uh, Miami is first. I'm not sure what's going on in Miami, but um, you know, part of the problem with Los Angeles is that our our, um, our wages have not kept up with uh, the price of housing. So unlike places where San Francisco, where the housing is actually more expensive, they also have higher incoming folks, largely driven by tech and the financial sector. Um, in terms of the homeless numbers, I mean, it's just right in front of our face. It's going to be one of the primary topics in the mayoral election coming up. And you've already seen a lot of ads on that and the candidates coming up with plans. But you know, currently we estimate about 66,433 homeless at last count. Um, and of course we're going through a homeless count right now and the results that took that were done, the surveying that was done in February will be released over the summer. So we'll have to take a close look at that. And you know, as you might imagine, typically there's an undercount. And then of course the um, that's mostly renting, right? And, and homeless housing, but you know, for the for, the fortunate that actually uh, get into a home and experience home ownership, the average home price in LA County is now seven hundred nine thousand, and um, you know that's an extraordinary number for the average person to be able to reach. And frankly, there aren't very many homes that are seven hundred nine thousand. That just happens to be the average. Um, some of you may have seen um, Steve Smith column in the LA Times this weekend that there was a three bedroom, one bathroom house in South Pasadena that listed for one point two million and it ended up selling for 2.5 million. So how the average person in LA, um, including many of you that are students when, you're, when, you, when you first graduate and you're gonna be making nice salaries, but still will be sort of priced out of the home ownership market. So um, very tough situation in terms of housing in LA. And of course, what we, many of us believe we need to do is just create more housing supply across all the different income spectrums to ultimately drive down costs. So, um, with that said, as a framing, uh, why don't we just go straight into the, the Q&A with the panel? Um, and so I'm going to direct the first question to Brian. But Brian, um, do the high land costs and other factors um, with, excuse me, due to the high land costs and other factors, development, um, affordable housing in Los Angeles typically requires uh, some sort of uh, public financing or subsidy. So uh, what funding tools are currently available um, and how does it allow you to make your pencils project in Los Angeles? Thanks, thanks, Tim, and uh, good to good to be with you all. Um, pr proud Anderson alum, and I was actually also an impact member back in the day, uh, 2003, 2005. So it's, it's great to be back with you all. Um, but you know, I think in the affordable housing world, we use a, um, a a pretty standard set of tools. The the tax credit and bond program are kind of the basic DNA of many uh, types of affordable housing developments. And and on top of those credits and bonds, we're layering. They're kind of an alphabet soup of sources, whether they be local, county, or state. Um, locally, it, it's very common to start an affordable housing project with a commitment from your local city, uh, likely the county as well, and then leveraging those sources into other 
uh, HCD or State of California funding programs like MHP or the ASIC program or IIG. There's a whole litany of uh, an alphabet soup, literally, of uh, state funding programs. So those are all very traditional sources. I think um, presently we're in an environment where the state's volume cap for tax exempt bonds has become competitive. It, it historically has not been competitive. And so we're grappling with kind of a new normal and trying to figure out other ways to finance affordable housing. And so, you know, one tool that we've um, begun to explore and actually successfully utilized late, late last year was using 501c3 bonds. So that's a, that's a resource and a tool that we as a nonprofit organization at an organization like Century Housing can access. And we, we went to the public capital markets and did several issuances of bonds to take down and preserve a senior housing asset in the city of Long Beach, which is actually our largest acquisition in century history. And, and that's a, a, a tax exempt tool that is not subject to the volume cap. It doesn't come with a 4% credits, um, which uh, traditionally uh, the tax exempt bonds come with, um, but it, it, is, it was a, a very effective tool for, for taking down that asset. So I think as the competitiveness for these state resources, some of which are federal that flow through the state and the state allocate, allocates um, become more competitive. And we in the industry are looking for other types of resources. Thank you. Um, yeah, I forgot a step, which is to let you guys all go through a short presentation on your properties, but why don't we finish out this topic first and then I'll allow you guys to do that. So any other um, uh, panelists want to comment on that? Nope. The okay. Al the alphabet soup it is. <laughs> yeah, uh, constantly searching for um, for sources of funding. But um, why don't we back up just briefly? And um, Tara, I know you have a, a couple slides to share with respect to the work that you do at um, Santa Monica Community Corp. Sure. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, Community Corp is a nonprofit that's been around for 40 years. So I just wanted to share a couple of photos of our affordable housing buildings in case some of you have not actually seen what affordable housing looks like. Um, and obviously, I think it really defies that conception that somehow it's, you know, below standard or dark and dreary and that sort of thing. So we're really proud of the work we do um, at Community Corp because we feel like our housing really elevates um, lower income households. And we focus a lot on high quality architecture, getting lots of natural air and light into buildings, um, and obviously focusing on environmental sustainability. So, you know, no big long slides, just uh, an image. I think there might be one more image of affordable housing. Yeah, that's it. Just to give you a sense of the beauty that you can actually achieve when you are successful in layering all your financing and uh, work with a good team, including a good architect, engineer, and contractor. There's another. Oh, okay. I forgot I included this one too, just to show that you know affordable housing usually is a lot more than just four walls and a roof. There's also a variety of service programs, and that can look different depending on the um, organization. But we focus, you know, mostly on community building, but also on well-being. So things like fitness classes, arts, culture, and community, um, and after-school programs for academic enrichment. I think people have a certain notion of what affordable housing is or looks like, but you know, I tell people you really, if you drove by, you would never know an affordable project versus a market rate project. And in fact, I would argue that some of the affordable projects are more aesthetically pleasing and better constructed and built uh, than market rate. So absolutely, that's, that definitely should not be a barrier in terms of objections for sure. Uh, they're beautiful projects physically. Okay, great. And uh, why don't we go to Greg? Why don't you tell us about the work at Daylight that you sort of incubated here at Anderson? Sure, sure, and 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 you're right, guys. This is not this is not your mother and father's affordable housing, right? This is uh, public-private partnership, privately owned, publicly financed. And I think sometimes we sort of conflate the historical public housing projects of the 1970s, and 1980s, um, sort of did away with public ownership of housing, and and now a more of a private model. Um, hey guys, I'm Greg. Uh, I am a Anderson alum, and uh, my dad actually still teaches at UCLA. I learned to swim at Sunset Rec. Uh, I came into Anderson in 2017 uh, with a sort of pre-business pre school background in investment banking, 
and wanted to do something socially conscious, didn't really know exactly what. And I had read a book about affordable housing. And basically the first day I walked into Tim's office and said, hey, uh, I'm your affordable housing guy. I want to meet everyone, like everyone on this panel and figure out you know, if there's a better way to do this. Um, so fast forward two years, we put uh, our business through the BCO program and basically founded uh, founded Daylight, you know, out of the out of the accelerator in the basement. We bought a site in South LA. We were really focused on modular construction and trying to bring the cost down. As we've talked, as as you've probably heard in the news, cost is a, is a huge focus in affordable housing. I think it's it's actually just construction across the across the gambit in Southern California. It's just very expensive, and and our figures are more public. I think that is actually uh, a messaging issue that we all need to work on. Uh, but generally, we you know we started the business. We've we now have six projects in construction, over 350 units under construction. Another two two projects behind that in uh, in the pre development phase, and we're uh, you know we're running in this uh, in this crazy crazy world. So um, everything we do to date that's in construction is in the permanent supportive housing world. Uh, it's it's uh, supportive housing for formerly homeless individuals. Uh, with on-site supportive services. We have some really great partners that operate the properties with case managers and social, worker, social workers. Um, but we've been able to, uh, to get this business started and, and, uh, and, uh, and now we're blocking and tackling and getting these things built. So this, is, uh, this project that you see here is Otsi's Place. It's a 46 unit project in Van Nuys. Uh, it's for formerly homeless women and survivors of domestic violence. Uh, the Downtown Women's Center is uh, is the service provider, and it's actually built with custom steel frame modules. So we're um, we have a ma modular manufacturer in Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, they they fabricate them off site. They bring them on site. They truck them into place and stack them all up. I promise it's more complicated than that, but uh, it's an easy way to pitch it. And back to you, Tim. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, so why don't we move on to Brian, um, give us an overview of your work at Century. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, so Century kind of has a unique origin story that involves environmental justice litigation uh, around the Century Freeway at 105, crisscrosses LA here. So long story short, we, be we began in a state agency that was established to right some of the wrongs of the freeway creation, the displacement that happened. And we were later spun off from the state in 1995 and became a private 501c3. Uh, with a charter to continue investing in, in affordable housing uh, up and down the state. So I represent our housing division here at Century. I have a colleague, Josh Hamilton, that runs our lending business for lenders to affordable housing developers like Greg and Tara and others uh, are, around the state. But uh, as it relates to our housing um, practice, we have a portfolio of a little over 2,100 units and a very uh, healthy pipeline of close to 2,400 units. Our mission uh, as an agency really involves around, uh, revolves around providing dignified housing and creating environments where our, our residents and our families and the individuals that we serve can break the cycle of poverty and really think about the future, right? Get, get out of the, the skip that, that cycle of poverty and homelessness. Um, so dating all the way back to the construction of the freeway, I think, you know, our mindset at Century has really been one of kind of an, a regional perspective. I think we all know that housing, the crisis that we're facing isn't exclusive to any one neighborhood or city. You know, we have 88 cities in L.A. County. Uh, it's really a regional and statewide um, crisis. And while we will absolutely continue to do our, our infill affordable housing deals. Um, our passion here is really about creating communities of scale and, and impact. And I'm gonna talk about a few of these. There's a few slides here that are, are kind of flashing um, some images of the various master plan communities that we're involved with. These are the villages at Cabrillo Long Beach, uh, our West LIBA project that we're in with two other partners, and then obviously this large one San Pedro effort that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. But these are very large redevelopment projects involving underutilized assets in our communities that have suffered from a lot of disinvestment over the decades. A uh, few of them are permanent support housing communities that are serving uh, or will serve thousands of individuals, households, and veterans in the in the years to come. So, you know, in a way, I think we're really trying to meet scale with scale in our in our investment in these larger uh, activities and, and endeavors. That's great. You know, one of the greatest challenges, we always talk about scalability, right? I mean, some of the some of the financing that's available, like the low-income housing tax credits, 
they're fantastic. Everything is needed. Um, but it's, you know, the amount of credits are, it's infinite and or it's not infinite. And we need for scalability. We, we, um, we just need more than that. So, but that's terrific. Thanks. Let's move on to our banker, um, Javier, and uh, you have a slide, I think, to share with us about some of the, the, the financing of these deals. So, Javier. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, my name is Javier Guzman. I am a senior relationship manager with City National Bank. Uh, I've been around the affordable housing industry for a while. Um, I, I'm somewhat unique in that I purposely wanted to get into affordable housing uh, coming out of the UCLA Urban Planning School. Uh, concentration in community development. So I've been on numerous sides of the business. I've been on the development side, the investment side, and, and ultimately the banking side. Um, <clears throat> City National Bank's been around for a while. It's it's somewhat known in LA as the bank to Hollywood. Uh, yeah. uh, we finance a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the studios, a lot of the movies, and a lot of the record companies that are uh, around in just not just LA, but now expanding throughout uh, New York and other parts of uh, the country. Um, along with that, uh, City National Bank has a strong community investment legacy, and that's what you see here. Uh, we, we've invested quite a bit uh, in many different ways, including community development loans, which seem to be our big thing, along with small business loans. Uh, we do um, issue quite a bit of, uh, quite a good number of grants, um, uh, to a lot of nonprofits, including uh, nonprofits that work in affordable housing. Um, and we also sponsor a lot of AHP, uh, which, which is uh, a specific uh, lending source or really more of a funding source for affordable housing here in California through the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco. Uh, we're actually one of the largest uh, AHP sponsors in California. And then ultimately, uh, we do also uh, work with equity. So we, we do help finance uh, affordable housing through equity, uh, not directly. We work through syndicators, but uh, we're looking to change that. Um, and uh, I actually started at City National a couple months ago, uh, and I was hired specifically to, to start the lending program at City National Bank. And that's what I'm doing here. Uh, I have a pretty extensive background. I've been I've worked at a union bank before and I worked at Chase doing affordable housing finance. So I'm looking forward to sharing what I know and I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully expanding a little bit more of the minds of affordable housing, uh, especially in students at UCLA. That's great. Thank you, Javier. Yeah, banks are an incredible, important partner in all of this. And, um, you know, I, I know that it's been challenging for some banks to even keep track with the industry, like, for example, modular, how do you really underwrite modular projects and things like that. So, but banks at the end of the day are going to be critical um, partners in all of this. So um, let's get back to the Q&A um, and stay on sort of this um, financing theme. Um, you know, we used to have something called redevelopment agencies here in Los Angeles, excuse me, in the state of California, and they were eliminated uh, in the core system in 2017, um, actually it was 2012. Uh, but it did prov provide at least some of that permanence, the source of funding that we talked about to, to, to help subsidize these projects. Um, and Brian got into some of the tools that they're using, whether it be, you know, tax increment, um, tax increment financing, or but there's other things too that have been proposed like transfer fees and uh, in lieu fees. And um, of course the bond measures like HHH, which most of you are probably taking advantage of. Um, but for Tara, you know, um, is there, what do you see anything in the horizon in terms of being able to create a permanent source of funding? And is any of, is any of this enough? And that's a rhetorical question because we know the answer to that. We already know the answer is it's never enough, right? right. Um, the sad reality is there's enough of us developers who are doing this work that if we could get the funding for all our projects, we could probably solve homelessness and the affordability crisis. So it really is a constraint. Um, the funding is a constraint, absolutely. Yeah. Some of the things that I'm encouraged about, though, is um, in terms of permanent sources, there are some already at the state level and the local levels. Of course, they're just not enough at all, but um, there are a lot of um, citizen-led ballot initiatives that are coming up. I know of two, one in the city of LA and one in Santa Monica, another one percolating in Culver City, um, that would be transfer fees that would raise significant funding for affordable housing. So it's great to see citizens taking action people focused on social justice and who want to make big impacts. Um, some of these bills could be game changers. 
Um, you know, seeing things like HHH come to fruition and get executed and utilized have been wonderful too. So hopefully there will be more opportunities like that. Um, we've also over the last few years seen the California budget surplus be a great vehicle to um, allocate funding to affordable housing and get more projects to the finish line. So I would love to see more permanent funding coming from the budget surplus, assuming there will continue to be one. Uh, but I think we need um, any and all of these ideas. We need more ballot initiatives. Cities need to take charge and create affordable housing trust funds, issue more bonds. It's an all hands on deck situation from my perspective. Yeah, the government has been sort of like sort handing out lots of cash and candy these days, right? So I guess the challenge is whether or not the state will be able to um, keep that going. And I think a lot of the surplus was maybe created by COVID. So we'll see, you know, it's very cyclical, the state budget, and sometimes we're up and sometimes we're down, but um, having a tremendous surplus is obviously uh, a good place to be. Anybody else have anything else to add to that at all? Greg? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, it, it's interesting and important to focus locally on these pro on these issues, right? These are local local problems. HHH was a city of LA measure to try and solve homelessness in Los Angeles, but big problems require big solutions, and that is where the federal government needs to come into play. Um, there was talk during Build Back Better to alleviate this competitive bond volume cap uh, that Brian spoke about. Uh, yeah. It's wonky, but changing the 50% test to 25%, basically doubling the amount of 4% tax credits in the in, in the market. Right now, you know, bonds are competitive, tax credits are competitive, and we can double the output with that uh, legislation. It's still possible, and it's bipartisan, but somehow it yeah. can't get done. Uh, so we'll see if that ever happens. Um, but I really do think, you know, to solve this stuff on a macro level, we really do need. Uh, we need our folks over in Washington to really, to really, uh, to step up, right? Yeah, absolutely. It'll be interesting to see, I mean, with the Biden administration, you know, how much additional funding goes into this. And, you know, I'm not even sure what agencies oversee this at the federal level, if it, whether it's HUD or Treasury, you know, Treasury did some of the eviction moratoria stuff. And I don't, do you have any, do you know? The IRS, right? This is tax. IRS, stuff. okay. Yeah. Terrific. Um, so I'm going to direct this question to Javier. It's really a finance question, but um, you know, with the Fed's moving interest rates higher, and I think it's very clear that they're going to be moving them even higher. Um, you know, what are what are the impacts on affordable housing and sort of borrowing costs, and how worried are you about inflation moving those uh, rates up higher? I, I, you know, and we we saw a little bit of uh, the increase in in uh, just material costs for construction yeah. a lot last year. Uh, you know, inflation is not going to help that. I think we, we saw, you know, lumber seemed to be one of the big ones that stood out, seemed to start moving down, but now it's kind of hanging out again and coming back up. And I think that's a lot with inflation. Uh, I know I heard something about uh, maybe some kind of market manipulation on coming from the lumber industry. Um, <clears throat> so I know the, the White House is working on, on costs, specifically lumber, but I think, uh, Financing wise, I think the the impact of increasing interest rates is felt immediately on performance, especially for projects that uh, have really tight budgets. Uh, I mean, we saw sulfur go up about thirty basis points in the span of maybe a week or two. And you think, uh, you know, if you have a nonprofit that has a really tight budget and uh, you know, they're getting ready to close and then all of a sudden your interest rate goes up by 30 basis point. That's that's a pretty large hit. And that that's something that's huge, especially for a nonprofit that's trying to get to, to the closing table. I think that's a big one that's coming. Um, I think uh, a lot of the banks are already starting to, you know, see some projects that are balanced become unbalanced in a matter of weeks because of that. And now you have mm -hmm. some kind of funding hole or you know, as is, is the usual practice, you take that from from your developer fee and you have to defer it. And I think that that's going to be a problem. Uh, underwriting wise for banks, I'm, I'm hearing a lot about, uh, you know, expecting larger underwriting cushions. And that also affects the budget. Uh, you know, we used to look at rates and underwrite to maybe a 15, 25 point uh, basis uh, uh, cushion. And now we're looking at maybe 50 uh, some banks are talking about higher than 50 as long as you're closing within 90 days and maybe even 
a hundred basis points if you're if you're looking at a, a longer period of time. So I, I do think uh, there's going to have to be some cushion built in if you're a developer and to try to prepare for some of these increases and, and their effects on on the performance. Yeah, we um, all of my developer friends, both market rate and affordable, are all lamenting the cost of lumber. It's way up right now, and. We're trying to figure out how much of that is supply chain and how much of that is maybe more permanent on a short term basis, too. But um, a, a related issue is the cost of labor, which is incredibly high right now, too. Um, and I might direct this question to Tara. Um, you know, when you use uh, public dollars or subsidies for the, a lot of these projects, um, typically requires or almost always requires prevailing wage or so union wage. And there's just always um, sometimes this friction between the trades and labor and Developers, I mean, I've heard that there's been some conversation about them trying to work together on, um, you know, what is a fair wage and that kind of thing. I mean, any promise in that area at all? I think there's been some uh, headway made in this regard. Mm -hmm. It has been a source of tension for many years. Um, you know, we're always balancing trying to reduce our costs. And so, you know, anytime there's, you know, the threat of something that could bring the costs up, it is, it's a difficult one for us um, but I will say there are some new ballot initiatives and um, bills being proposed that try to bridge bridge the divide and bring the groups together. Um, the United to House LA measure, which is this led initiative, um, we we came to a compromise, and by we I say the coalition of people who are working on this measure, including SCAMF, of which I'm on their board, um, to agree to a project labor agreement. Um, which would not increase the costs as much as the skilled and trained workforce classification, which is what the labor trades are asking for now, which is a classification that would add costs that exceed prevailing wage. So, um, you know, at this point, we're all paying prevailing wage, which, and look, we understand that it's a good thing. We want to pay people a living wage so they can afford those astronomical rents that you shared with us earlier. Mm -hmm. There has to be a point where we also can make sure our projects are cost reasonable. So that has been uh, progress. There's also a brand new bill that um, Assemblymember Buffy Wicks just uh, announced today or yesterday, AB 2011, that actually she was able to reach an agreement with the Carpenters Union to charge prevailing wage, but also add apprenticeship and healthcare requirements. And in lieu of that, was able to avoid skilled and trained and project labor agreements um, and has gotten the support of labor trade. So I do see a lot of progress in this regard. That's great. And have you, was there a shortage of labor right now or? Well, I feel like there is, at least in Southern California here, yeah. we're going gangbusters, you know, trying to build all this affordable housing. I, I don't know about you, Greg or Brian, but, you know, certainly we've got contractors not even willing to bid because they're too busy and they're yeah. more selective. And affordable housing is more of a pain in terms of the types of projects they choose to work on. So, so it's a struggle for sure. Yeah, great. So I'm going to uh, direct the next question to you, Greg. Um, you know, one of the differences between, say, a market rate project and affordable is really the, the complexity of the capital stack. Sometimes you'll have as many as 10 sources in there. And, you know, many people in our business will equate it to building lasagna, just sort of layer by layer by layer. Um, but, you know, what are, what are the challenges that you confront by, by having to piece together so many sources of capital to make a deal work? Sure, sure. And and Brian, Brian uh, named the acronyms that, uh, yeah. that we won't go into, but there are many of them at the city, state, and uh, city, state, and local level. Um, you know, at the end of the day, to, to distill it down, affordable housing is solving a market failure, right? You don't have a high enough rent to cover the cost of construction, and there's only so much you can charge. So how do you make up that gap financing? That gap financing is through these loan programs, through the city and the county, tax credits, basically whatever you can muster together in order to get the project done. Uh, for homeless projects, add on project-based vouchers and supportive services funding, and you get even more complicated. But at the end of the day, a lot of our projects will have you know, multiple levels of these gap loan programs from the city and the state level, couple that with tax credits, as well as you know, maybe a couple other programs uh, sort of, you know, gluing it all together. And what's challenging about it is, is what we're all saying is that it's hyper competitive, right? So if your project costs $500,000 a door, um, you're, you know, you're going to have to go get in line for two or three of these programs. 
if you if your project costs a little bit less, and that's why you know Tara's talking about you know trying to avoid project labor agreements, maybe you omit one of those sources, and maybe you skip a year of pre development, and you're and you're able to sort of um, shave down that time to assemble the super financing. You know, other than other than sort of the time and competitive and associated with these programs, um, they all come with different strings, right? Different overlays, different population targets, and it can get complicated, right? You can have one unit that has a specific income requirement, two different population targets, and all of a sudden, that's actually a difficult unit to lease up in what is supposed to be a very, you know, a, a high demand environment. So, you know, it's it's complicated. I think one could argue we have too many too many underfunded programs uh, instead of fewer, well, better capitalized programs. But the state's moving in that direction. Uh, to 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 combine and 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 try and simplify. So it's all all it it's uh it's complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated. I'm gonna combine our next couple of questions, just the name of time. They were very related, but you know, um we, we certainly currently have kind of an exclusionary zoning system in LA where and I can tell you a lot of the single family uh, residences are obviously not this is kind of a NIMBY question too. And I almost put it as like this sort of progressives paradox. We have a fairly progressive city, even in some of our more influent neighborhoods. But when you talk about upzoning their neighborhoods and having maybe more middle or income people live there, and maybe these people are going to their schools and going to their grocery stores, you know, maybe not so progressive anymore. So, um, you know, what can we do in, in terms of changing our zoning? And of course, there's always this issue of buy right and some of the density bonuses that have been awarded through TOC. Uh, maybe some adaptive reuse stuff. We just saw SB9 come down where you can split your single family lot into two. Um, but but uh, what what would you like to see in terms of zone changes to accommodate some of this density and driving down costs? And I'll start with Brian, but it looks like Greg and everybody else might have something to say too, but maybe what, what are your thoughts there, Greg? Or excuse me, Brian. Sure. So, you know, there's been a uh, spate of housing legislation flowing out of Sacramento over the past I'd say three to four years. And that legislation has, has uh, created a number of new tools for us developers, in particular in the affordable housing realm, that have allowed us to move forward with um, you know, essentially ministerial by right projects that are affordable and are supportive. So these are state legislation like SB 35 mm -hmm. and um, uh, AB 1763, uh, which basically provides an unlimited density bonus for, uh, for affordable housing projects, which is pretty spectacular when you think about it. Um, and then there have been some companion bills that have provided basically automatic sequel clearances for supportive housing deals. That's legislation like AB 2162. So I think we're finding ways to use these tools in, in cities throughout uh, the Southland here. And I think one of the challenges is sometimes that, the, you know, the, the, the pace of legislation, it, it's hard for planners and cities to keep up with it. So sometimes we're educating uh, our, our, our public agency planning friends about, you know, what these resources are and how to use them. And, and um, I, I think we've, we found great benefit in, in some of these, including, you know, we recently used AB 2162 in the city of LA to um, accelerate, a, a, it was a complex entitlement and we got that done in six months in time to make our tax credit and, and bond out, out application. So uh, we found some, some very useful resources on that front. That's great. Anybody else want to add to that? No, okay, great. Um, so why don't we move on to Greg, a question. Everybody talks about the cost of parking and how that's an impediment to getting stuff built, but um, you know, what are your thoughts there on what we could do to reform parking requirements in LA for developers? It's, it's, it's these two questions back to back are very funny because measure JJJ, which, yeah. which passed TOC, uh, basically created a zero parking requirement for affordable housing projects. So a rent restricted unit at whether it's 60 or 80%, I'm not sure everything we do is 60 or lower, but at some a, at an affordable an, an affordable housing unit in the city of Los Angeles does not have a parking requirement. For it then becomes a question of lease up, right? So for per, permanent supportive housing, at least on our projects, we do not provide parking uh, for our tenants. Most of our tenants don't have cars. Um, then when we move into a more traditional affordable housing, low income families, people that have to commute and get to work, 
it's more a question of lease up and parking actually becomes uh, a critical tool. Um, going back to your JJJ question though, is, you know, the, the reason why I felt like those two questions are kind of, th those two questions are kind of interesting is JJJ basically also created the environment where a zone change triggers a project labor agreement. Yeah. So in the city of Los Angeles, you can't really take on a project that is inappropriately zoned. If it's zoned for housing or some type of housing, Brian is completely right. The, you know, this, the state tools are incredible. You basically have a limited density, but if you have a project that has an agricultural zone or it's zoned for single family, you really aren't able to build multifamily. And I think, I think that's something as JJJ comes up for, for revote that we're collectively going to need to take a look at. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, Next but should question. I just add one thing, Tim? Oh, sure. um, you know, for us, there is also the complication of community acceptance of affordable housing projects. I have two projects on the west side that I've had to put more parking than I wanted to. And that's because I simply, you know, didn't want to do a, a all drag out battle with the community who were you know, completely fighting against our projects because they felt like our parking was inadequate. And, you know, we have to, you know, kind of thread this needle of getting not only the community to accept the project, but also the council district. You know, there's like political ramifications. If you want to get funding from City of LA, you've got to make sure your local electeds are accepting of the project as well. So, you know, when I talk to people about parking policy, I say, let the developers right size the parking for what they think is appropriate for their residents. So I totally agree with Greg for permanent supportive housing. You really don't need a whole lot of parking. You do want a couple spaces for your, your staff, uh, but you know, for family housing, it is a leasing issue. Absolutely. Um, you know, our, many of our low income families, they drive around for their jobs or they have children yeah. they're raising that they need to take to school and soccer practice, just like the rest of us. So, um, but, you know, again, I think allowing us to right size, maybe having no parking minimums at all for any housing and mm -hmm. let's right size would be a good solution. Yeah, let the market set it. Um, that is an interesting question. Though. I mean, obviously there's a lot of political opposition and neighborhood opposition to these projects. And I know that frequently you as developers need to go out in advance of your projects and really have conversations with the community and have conversations with the politicians. Um, you know, is that just sort of standard practice for your, for the, for your development projects? I guess, Tara, you can answer. I can start on that one. Absolutely. We need to get the buy-in of our local electeds and policymakers on our projects. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would echo that. We, you know, we're, we view ourselves as long-term owners and investors, and we become part of the fabric of these neighborhoods. And we want to get to know our neighbors, and our electeds, and, and want that acceptance that um, Tara, you know, Tara spoke of. We, we don't always agree eye to eye on everything and we, we, we won't always satisfy every community request, um, but we want to make a good faith effort to, uh, to be good neighbors. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen... Something, oh. Sorry, I was just going to add that I think it's something that sets our group apart from market rate, um, pure market rate developers, is that work that we do with the community. Many times there are compromises that can be had so that we can still do our work, but you know, then the community five years from now can say, that was that was a good project and a good dialogue versus some developers who don't take the time to do that. Yeah, no, I think it's really critical. Um, and it's the right thing to do, I think, too, so... Um, you know, the other thing that we hear a lot about is this cumbersome um, kind of approval process in the, in the city of L.A. or the county of L.A., the 88 jurisdictions here. Um, you know, you're frequently having to go run down the planning department and then go to utilities and then go to building and safety. And there's been a lot of conversation about streamlining that process, making it much easier, easier for developers. And I think that the planning offices are and, you know, the city agencies are aware of this and they're at least talking about trying to do some of these streamlining processes, but, you know, maybe Brian, I'll, I'll turn back to you and ask you, um, what are your thoughts on this? And are we actually making any progress? <laughs> we do a lot of work in the city of Long Beach. And I have to say, Long Beach is a, a very developer friendly city. It's an easy place to look. There are challenges in Long Beach, but um, it's infinitely, I'd say, easier to, to develop and, and work through issues with city staff there and the agencies. There's a lot more collaboration. You know, it's a half city of a half million people. It's a big city uh, by our nation's standards. It kind of gets lost in, in the kind of the 
the, the larger LA metropolis, but you know, comparing Long Beach to Los Angeles, L, the city of LA is infinitely more complex. The, the number and the number of approvals and, and the, the kind of uh, being shifted from one department to another, um, it's it's very complex. We we don't do as much work in LA. Um, and I, my colleagues are on the table here. We certainly speak more more to that than than me. But I can just say. Uh, but Long Beach is a um, it, it's a breath of fresh air <laughs> compared to what it takes to get things done in Los Angeles. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so for those of you who don't know, um, LA County is made up of 88 independent cities, and so each one of them has their own you know set of rules and everything else too. So a lot Los Angeles being the largest city within the within the county. Um, I could probably just have time for a couple quick, quick, rapid fire questions. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to, we've been talking a lot about new construction and new development. And, um, you know, I think a, a, a part of the strategy that we need to employ too is the preservation of existing uh, affordable housing. And so maybe I'll talk, uh, turn to you, Tara. Uh, what sort of efforts do we need to actually ensure that current real estate and, and housing units that are affordable remain so? Yes, we're working on that strategy as well from an anti-displacement strategy. It's obviously really important. I would say what we need is more flexible funding. Um, you know, right now the funding is just sort of, you know, within certain constraints and boxes that don't work very well for acquisition rehab and keeping residents in place. Um, so that would be my number one request. Also, it is, you know, we're still trying to figure out ways that nonprofits can get an incentive for, you know, being the, you know, purchasers of these buildings. So I, there's been some legislation and ideas tossed around. Hopefully that'll help. Yeah. You know, this is also true with the missing middle and I've heard some interesting um, uh, strategies that you guys have probably all heard too, but maybe a city agency goes in and buys an apartment building and would does the sort of typical value add play on multifamily, but rather than increase the rents, they actually reduce the rents. And in return, they get some uh, tax credit abatement uh, and some um, covenants that would need to stay with that building as well. So um, we'll see how that develops over time as well. Last question uh, before we wrap it up, because we do want to have time for a couple questions. You know, we know that housing um, is really a social determinant of a lot of things, including health and well being and education and public safety. But we also know that a lot of uh, lower income neighborhoods and neighborhoods with people of color um, are disproportionately, disproportionately impacted by, by, by some of these things. Um, you know, I'll turn to Javier as the banker. I know bankers are very concerned about equity and social equity and those kinds of things. But um, what are your thoughts on how do we create a more equitable Los Angeles in terms of, uh, of housing? I think, you know, for me, coming from a planning background from UCLA, I think, uh, you know, it's definitely a big picture. I, I think, uh, you know, big picture things like zoning, uh, being able to increase density are, are really important. Uh, the city already does things like uh, build transit oriented development. Um, that always helps. But to me, the big one is just continuing to develop and supportable, uh, support affordable housing in all areas, uh, whether they be affluent or non-affluent. That's just more of an equitable, you know, everybody Everybody should have an opportunity to live, you know, in a nice neighborhood with nice parks and good schools. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of nonprofits, uh, you know, try to do the best that they can. You know, it, it all depends on, you know, land costs, for instance. I know, for instance, you know, Tara builds in Santa Monica, and that, that's obviously something that's a big concern. Um, but one of the big opportunities that I think we're going to see a lot of is workforce housing. Somebody mentioned, you know, the missing middle. And I think that that's going to be an opportunity, not just for nonprofits, but developers in general, on how to increase affordable housing, not just, you know, for the extremes of, of uh, low income workers in L.A., but I think, uh, you know, the teachers, the firemen and some of some of the people that work in our communities, um, and, and I hope that uh, one of the big things that I want to do here at City National is be able to lend for projects that are not specifically tax credit projects, uh, a little bit more creative, uh, and a, li a little bit more uh, of an opportunity to build uh, for different populations. Yeah, there's lots of you know, we, you know, concerns about sort of displacement as a result of investment and gentrification along transit and all the other things, too. But we need to ensure that the people that live in these communities with the, you know, reasonable housing are able to stay even after these communities begin to develop and, and, and see some investment and some improvement. 
So listen, I didn't get a chance to answer, to get to nearly all the questions we had, which I sort of suspect would be the case. Hopefully we gave you just a sort of brief overview of some of the issues that uh, developers face with respect to this issue. Um, You can follow the Zyman Center, you go to our website. We do a ton of work on this area, papers, seminars, future stuff that you can do. Um, So uh, stay in touch with us and look out for future programs. And with that, let me turn it over back to Eli uh, to maybe answer a couple of audience questions to the panel. Eli. All right, everyone. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, thank you guys so much for that panel. Um, we had some great questions in the chat uh, or in the q and I'm um, going to go over a couple of them in the interest of time, and, and maybe we can get to a few more uh, if, if people want to stay on. But the first is um, in regards to, there were a couple of questions that came up around public funding and the use of 100% um, I'm sorry, not public funding, private funding, and you have 100% private funds to fund some of these projects. So, Greg, this one's directly addressed to you. Um, do you think modular construction will be at a sufficient scale one day to bring down costs and deliver a high enough IRR using 100% private capital, avoiding the time-consuming application slash approval process of government funding? Um, modular is a great tool in the toolbox, right? It's not... It's not for every project and a project needs to be designed very specific for modular. I think we need to get to a place where a factory or a set of factories have, you know, five or six different options. And then you plug those into your plans right now, everything is custom and it's less efficient than it should be. We're saving money because we're in a prevailing wage environment. We're able to save costs, but, uh, not without a lot of gray hair. So, uh, we're moving in that direction, but we are not there yet. I'm trying to save time with these questions. And Eli, I'm available to stick around for an extra five, 10 minutes if you go over, if um, I don't know about the rest of the panelists, but um, we'll get there um, as quickly as we can. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're good on time. Um, and then I guess uh, the, the second question that was around private funding was, um, has, have you guys had any experience with uh, crowdfunding or fractionalization of ownership? in any of your work? Or do you sort of see that being a future option for funding some of these affordable housing projects? Um, I mean, I I think fractional ownership, you know, co-op funding, it's been done in other cities. I don't see why we couldn't do it here in Los Angeles. It's a way, it's a, you know, it's it's an alternative way to start building equity and have home ownership. Um, We know that, you know, one of the issues with lack of home ownership is the lack of generational wealth attainment. That's how most of us, um, you know, create wealth. And so anything you could do to sort of get on the equity, um, you know, treadmill and beginning to, to, to build equity in a home, I, I think is useful. I think we need to consider uh, all alternatives like co-ops and fractional ownership. Anyone else? All right. And then um, just a question around another question around home ownership. Um, is there, do you see a model in which there is sort of an affordable, uh, sort of like an affordable purchasing um, of, of homes that is, you know, significantly discounted um, from the, the prices that we're seeing in LA? Uh, like, for example, you know, do you see a world in which you could say build a unit for the current cost, but then also only sell it for close to say like, a little bit above the cost of construction um, in order to provide new entrance for home, homeowners at at or slightly above the same price. Best thing you could do is move to Nevada. <laughs> Unfortunately. There are very yeah. much restricted um, affordable home ownership programs in LA County. Century used to have a, a, a modest program um, but it requires, especially as prices have increased so significantly, it requires a very heavy infusion of soft second financing. And so you need a local agency or a county or a state program to provide that heavy subsidy. And then you're only really supporting one household. Obviously, when that house sells, um, uh, the, the deed restriction allows you to re- re- essentially recapture the home and sell it to the next household at an affordable price. And so you're able to recycle that subsidy um, but, you know, I think it's, it's just, it's a limited tool. It's, it's a great idea. Um, I, I think we, as an industry have struggled to figure out how to scale that. Yeah. 
There's also inclusionary housing, which we don't have a ton of in LA, but um, uh, they've done more of this, I think, in San Francisco, where they'll, you can get some density, bo- density bonuses and a certain amount of for sale product needs to be set aside for lower income individuals. Have you done any of that, Brian, at all? Or? Um, no, we've not. It's mostly like the Relateds and the four cities and some of those larger groups that do that. Yeah. But, but again, not super scalable. Tim, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, inclusionary zoning in the city of LA, every new large scale development is going to have certain numbers of low income units within them, right? Yeah, so I think we were talking about for sale. And there was a lawsuit in San Jose a number of years ago where they actually, for the first time, included inclusionary on for sale product. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Santa Monica has a great inclusionary housing program and it's working quite well. We're, we actually do some of those partnerships with market rate developers. So I'm hoping that other cities will adopt policies like that in the future. Yep. Can I ask a question? Yes. For, for our nonprofit developers at the table. Have you guys ever thought about the idea of year 15 condo eyes? Hmm. Right? So you take a year 15 product and then you condo eyes it and you sell it to the family that lives there? I think you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought about that, no. We haven't either, but. Well, there's allowable under the, under the statute. Um, I've read about it, but I've never seen it. Be- yeah, because you have a fifty-five year Because you have a 55-year affordability covenant, right? Yeah. I've seen some rent-to-own models that look pretty interesting too. We'll have to watch all of it. Eli, another question? Yeah, another question just came in. Um, of the LA mayor candidate, mayoral candidates, do you believe that one has a particularly strong plan to um, incorporate to yeah incorporate affordable housing or really address this issue? Not asking for an you know endorsement, but just um, any any one in particular that's caught your eye. I'll just say as nonprofits, we can't really, um, you know, talk specifically about candidates, but I will say that tomorrow there is going to be a forum for the LA uh, mayoral candidates at 10 o'clock at the Colburn School um, that is specifically focused on affordable housing on homelessness. So there's probably still time to register if you want to attend. That's a great punt. It's a great punt. (laughs) She's a good Um, politician. I know that there, I mean, let's the mayor the mayoral race is going it, to, it's already starting to boil down to the key topics are homelessness and crime. So I think, I'm not sure about general affordable housing or maybe low income housing, but certainly, a, but homelessness housing is going to be a big issue. And I understand Caruso already has a plan out. I haven't seen it. Um, and I know that Karen's either working on it or going to release something soon as well. So Bass, so we'll see. Yeah, no, excited, excited to see what comes out. Um, I'll just end by, by asking, you know, as, as students and um, both undergrad and graduate students interested in, in housing and issues of real estate, um, what are some ways that we can get involved in, in you know, improving, improving uh, affordable housing in California and, and making it more accessible to all? I'd say, you know, there's opportunities with AMR projects um, to work for a, an affordable housing developer, whether it's a for-profit or non-profit. We have a lot of needs. Work. We have challenges with respect to staffing right now ourselves. Um, it, but also, there are internship opportunities. I know we've got a, a lot of internship posting right now. A little plug for for Century, but um, you know we're all we're all looking for good, dedicated people. Yeah, I, I would add consider doing this as a career. You know, I, I think that it, you'll be obviously addressing a social need. Um, you can make a pretty fine living at it. Uh, I think that. Um, you know, we're, real estate's very cyclical, and I think there's going to be funding available for this because it sort of has non-pro- nonpartisan support. So I think that if, you know they'll they'll be funding around for affordable housing on a going forward basis, and of, of course, very rewarding at the same time. So I would consider looking into into careers. I would say that, and I would also say it's, you can also get involved with a lot of these social justice groups like LA Forward, who have housing advocacy groups that um, basically send um, people to community meetings to speak in support of affordable housing. We always need help in that regard. All righty. Um, well, guys, thank you all so much. I um, just want to quickly end um, with uh, just talk a little bit about, I'm just going to you know, somewhat shamelessly plug the rest of this week here. Um, 
we have more events. We have three more events tomorrow. The uh, faculty lecture is virtual um, for those who are located somewhere far away or don't not want to come to campus. Um, our Thursday schedule is very much about uh, the future of um, the future of transportation and electric vehicles in LA. And then we have a full uh, schedule on Friday of um, including a keynote by the COO of LA 2028. So, um, you know, please consider attending more events. We're really excited about this week. And uh, thank you so much to this panel for, for such an engaging and interesting lecture. And um, yeah, hope, hope everyone, I hope everyone uh, on the panel, or sorry, everyone who attended learned something and hope the panelists did as well. So thank you all so much. And um, yeah, really appreciate your time.